December football is here. Mike McClure is not. Welcome into Fantasy Football Today at DFS on Thursday, December 2nd. Frank Stanfield joined by Sina Jad, and Mike is right here in my backyard. Not literally, but he is here in New York spending the weekend watching some Knicks Bulls basketball. Uh, we do have a very worthy guest, I promise you here, joining us today. You've heard him on Fantasy Football Today and FFT in 5. You can read all of his great work over on Sportsline. It is Jacob Gibbs. What is going on, man? What's up, Frank? Glad to be on. Uh, I don't know about filling Mike's shoes. Mike is a legend. I'm pretty jealous he's at an NBA game, but <laughs> I'm excited to be here. Excited to talk some football. Yeah, and true story, uh, as long as right before we started, Sia joins and he's like, how was I not following Jacob Gibbs on Twitter? This guy has an amazing Twitter where he just tweets out a bunch of awesome stats all week long. So make sure to follow Jacob on Twitter at J-A Gibbs underscore 23. I do want to ask the 23, is that like Jordan related? Is it? Yeah, it was my basketball number back in high school, and I've just never changed it because I'm lazy. Yeah. <laughs> all right, that's fair enough. I mean, that's what I figured. What's going on, See, How are we doing? We're doing good. I'm I'm looking forward to bouncing back. I think we, we talked about it Tuesday. I, I think last week was probably my worst DFS slate. Uh, Thanksgiving was good, but the actual like main slate, it wasn't so good. So I'm actually really excited to bounce back. We know that, especially when we're kind of maxing GPPs, when I say maxing, I mean, playing a little bit more GPP versus cash, which is what I do, um, you can have some bad weeks. And so you kind of just have to take that and move on to the next week and bounce back. So let's get it started. Let's do it. Week 13, deep dive. We're going to hit every game here. We'll have my dad's sneaky DFS picks. And uh, we will also have some pre-recorded audio that Mike McClure uh, sent in revealing some of his favorite plays. We'll wrap up later on, of course, with our cheat sheet, our favorite value chalk, contrarian, and stack of the week. Week 13, though, four teams on a bye, the Browns, the Packers, the Titans, and the Panthers. And we have an 11-game main slate. No Cowboys, no Chiefs, no Bills. All of those teams are playing in prime time this week. We have two games with a total over 50 points as of now. That's the Chargers at the Bengals and the Bucks at the Falcons. Washington football team at the Raiders currently checks in at 49 and a half. We have two double digit spreads with the Bucks laying 11 on the road at the Falcons and the Rams hosting the Jaguars. They are 13 point favorites there. Let's start with what is likely to be the most popular game on the main slate. And that is the Chargers at the Bengals. The Bengals are three point favorites with a 50 and a half point total uh, tied for the highest total. As I mentioned here on the main slate, all odds come via Caesar Sportsbook. And for the Chargers, cornerback Asante Samuel Jr. did not practice on Wednesday because of a concussion, did not see the Thursday practice report yet. And then on the Bengals side, uh, two pieces of their offensive line, center Trey Hopkins and tackle Riley Reef did not practice on Wednesday, though Reef is expected to play. Uh, Chris Evans, also a DNP for the Bengals. See, I'll start with this. I'm a little bit worried about this game. Chargers traveling east for a 1 p.m. start. The last time that happened this season, they lost to the Ravens 34 to 6. So I also think both teams here, their secondaries have been solid this season. You know, I, I was looking into the Chargers. They've given up some big games to, to number one wide receivers. But on the whole, their secondaries have been pretty good. Uh, do you share the same concerns? If not, how are you looking to stack this game here? Chargers, Bengals. Yeah, I share the same concerns, to be honest with you. Uh, it's very noteworthy about their secondaries. But but also, you're right. You know, When the Chargers traveled east last time, and I'm not going to use that as the sole like precedent and barometer for, for this, but like Herbert's been pretty inconsistent over the last four to six games. So it's one of those things where I could absolutely see them coming out flat again, and, and I could see them really leaning on Austin Eckler like they did last week. He got over 90% of the carries last week. And uh, he has a 20% target share. So I think if you want to get a piece of this game, but you don't want to stack it, there's there's some obvious ways to do that with both running backs in the game. I think Keenan Allen, of course, is, is a volume machine. So you can kind of lean on him in the same way you might lean on like a Deontay Johnson type receiver. But uh, yeah, I share your worry. Th this When the week started, I looked at this and I said, okay, this is probably going to be one of my top three stacks. Not my favorite. It was never my favorite, but it was probably going to be somewhere in the top three. I'm not so sure it's there anymore. I like pieces of this game, but I don't think I want to stack it. By the way, I, I talked about Herbert, but Joe Burrow and company are running the ball quite a bit. They're leaning on Mixon, as we'll talk about. So uh, I think this one's going to be take some pieces and go somewhere else. Yeah, and I think if you are stacking this game, I have no problem if you're doing Herbert to Keenan Allen, just bringing it back with Joe Mixon, not even going to the pass catchers on the other side, and, and vice versa. If you wanted to go Joe Burrow with Jamar Chase, bring it back with Austin Eckler, I, I think any of those stacks are, are viable here in the spot. But with you, uh, Sia, I think, a spoiler alert, 
uh, our favorite stacks of the week. None of us had any of the quarterbacks in this game as, as our favorite stack. So, Jacob, what are you thinking here? Obviously, the running backs are in really good spots with both Austin Eckler and uh, Joe Mixon. The Chargers are allowing 4.6 yards per carry to the position that is the fourth most. The Bengals are allowing 7.4 receptions per game to the position that is the second most. So what do you think about the running backs? What do you think about stacking this game in general? Yeah, I'm kind of on the same wave as you guys. I don't think I'm going to have a ton of stacks here. I think I will have a few lineups where I use Mixon and bring it back with Herbert and Mike Williams. Um, I just like the tournament appeal there. I don't know if people are going to be on Big Mike. He's pretty cheap. Um, and I think if the game script sets up well uh, for Mixon to you know see a massive workload like we've seen lately, then that's going to involve a lot of downfield passing um, to Williams. And so I like the upside there. And I think Keenan Allen, uh, see a hit on him. He's, I think he's just really in a, an overlooked uh, great spot here, especially on FanDuel. I think everybody's going to gravitate towards Deontay, but I honestly prefer Keenan on FanDuel. And then just specifically, um, the Bengals use a ton of press coverage. And Keenan Allen has been really, really good when press, like best receiver in the league, basically. Like targeted a really high rate. His yards per runner is way up as well. Um, so I think he's definitely in a great spot. But overall, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about the quarterback play, and I don't think I'll have a ton of stacks. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you there. Uh, the early cash build that I had, surprisingly, I didn't have Jonathan Taylor or Cooper Cup in the lineup. I just had a bunch of mid-tier plays. I had Deontay mm -hmm. in there. I had Keenan Allen in there. Uh, kind of toying with the quarterback position right now. I don't know if I want to use Brady, get up there, or, or maybe use someone like Derek Carr, but we could talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, we do have some thoughts from Mike here, who he likes at the quarterback position. He actually does like this game quite a bit, so play that audio here, uh, then maybe we can react to it or whatever. All right, just want to run through my player pool really quickly at the quarterback position, keeping it pretty simple. I'm running five different quarterbacks this week in my five lineups, starting with Joe Burrow, Cincinnati Bengals. Love the stack here with Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, maybe even a little running back stack with Joe Mixon. And then on the other side, I love Justin Herbert to Keenan Allen. This game is easily the most stackable game on the main slate here. I've taken the over 50 and a half. My simulations have it all the way up to 52 if you follow along over on sports line and the early edge podcast you already know that i'm very much in on this game uh, other quarterbacks i'm using though i love Derek carr he's going to be popular but i love it because it's a really fun game to stack you've got the natural double stack with Foster Moreau and Hunter Renfro. Neither one really going to break the bank when you consider the fact that Derek Carr is only 6K in this game. And then on the other side, Antonio Gibson was heavily involved in the passing game in that last game with J.D. McKissick also taking some of the role. McKissick looks like he might be out for a bit here. So this is a great spot to buy in on this game stack in general where you can run it back with Antonio Gibson. And then finally, Tom Brady, Obvious makes sense here. I think this is a spot where they can put up a lot of points. I do think, like Sia talks about many weeks, I think this this is a guy who wants to win the MVP award. I think he throws the touchdowns in. And then finally, Kirk Cousins. We've talked a little bit about how the offense opens up without Dalvin Cook there. They like to throw to Alexander Madison. So I like Kirk Cousins here. I think it's another time we can buy back in there. All right. So if you're watching us here on YouTube, apologies, because it's just a bunch of us like looking around the whole time while Mike is talking. But he sent me like five minutes of audio. So I chopped it up a little bit into different positions. He does like this game. He likes both quarterbacks on on either side of this game. So if you want to do something a little bit different than than what we uh, just gave you, then listen to Mike. He, he likes both Joe Burrow yeah. and uh, Justin Herbert. Yeah, and one thing he pointed out, uh, he pointed out T. Higgins, who's still presenting as a value. If you look at him on DraftKings 5,800, I mean, the, the, the route share versus Jamar Chase, it, it's been pretty much equal over the last few weeks. They're kind of like alternating in terms of that, uh, in terms of the, the leader of the pack there. And obviously he can go off. So I think 5,800, I, I like the Jamar Chase play, but if you just want to pay down, if you want to do that stack and pay down to uh, T. Higgins or double stack it with them both, uh, it's certainly in play. And by the way, when he said this is the most stackable game, I don't necessarily disagree with him in the sense that from a star power standpoint, you're really looking at like who, like, you know, where the, the shares are going to go. It's up to you to pick the right ones. But, you know, on one side of the ball, it's Mixon, it's Jamar Chase, it's T. Higgins. It's probably not Tyler Boyd. And on the other side, it's Austin Eckler, Keenan Allen, and Mike Williams. It is probably not Jared Cook. So you have kind of three on each side. It's very stackable. The question is, is it going to be the passing fest that people think, or are they going to lean on the running backs? I lean on the running back side of this. It sounds like Jacob does as well, but we could absolutely be wrong there, and it could it could be a shootout like the total suggests it might be. Yep, I think we're all in agreement there. 
Uh, let's move on to the Bucks at the Falcons. The Bucks are 11 point favorites, 50 and a half point total. Antonio Brown likely out two more games with that ankle injury. Offensive lineman Ali Marpet, linebacker Devin White, and cornerback Jamel Dean were at Thursday's practice for the Bucks. And it sounds like they could get cornerback Carlton Davis back for this game as well. On the Falcon side, defensive lineman Jonathan Ballard did not practice. Uh, we've seen this a few times this year where the team with the highest implied total on the main slate in this case, the Bucs, uh, also is a massive favorite in the game here. So uh, the, the Bucs won their earlier meeting in this game against the Falcons, 48-25. to 25. That was back in week two. Let's start here with Lombardi Lenny. Fournette scored four touchdowns last week, second in the NFL with 51 red zone opportunities, ninth among running backs with a 14% target share. He has an amazing role, really strong offense, obviously. The salary has now climbed, however. Up to 7,300 on DK, 7,700 on FanDuel. Jacob, we'll start with you. How do you feel about Leonard Fournette this week in this matchup against the Falcons? I think you can make a case that Fournette's the strongest uh, running back play on FanDuel, honestly. Um, and he's like firmly in play on DraftKings as well, given the passing usage we saw last week. Uh, they basically just took Gio Bernard out of the game plan and gave all of those reps to Leonard Fournette. And Fournette really only seeded a, a small portion of his early down work to Ronald Jones. And it's possible he wouldn't even lose that in a more competitive game script uh, than what we saw last week. Not that they're going to see a very competitive game script here. Um, but yeah, I mean, there really are not very many running backs with a better role than what he has right now. And he is priced up. He's really not priced for the role that we've seen. So I, I think he's one of the strongest plays in any position, really. Yeah, and especially on Fandle. I know you mentioned like how how great you know he is there in terms of value. Uh, like touchdowns just matter so much there in the half point PPR, mm -hmm. and he's seeing so many red zone opportunities. So yeah, I think that's a really nice call there from you. Uh, in that earlier meeting back in week two, we saw Tom Brady throw five touchdowns in that game. Two went to Mike Evans. Two went to Rob Gronkowski. One went to Chris Godwin. And if we're just looking at target share over the last two weeks since Rob Gronkowski has returned, he leads the team, twenty-two percent target share. Uh, Mike Evans second at 20%. See, how are we looking at stacking the buck side of things here? And I think normally when we see a spread this big, we tell people you don't have to bring it back with a, with a player on the other side. And I, I kind of feel like that's where we're at with the Falcons. It is. And it isn't, I'm, I'm going to be taking some shots with uh, correlating it back with the, with the Falcons. I'll get to that in one second. I do want to say there's some breaking news that really just came out in the last few minutes. Uh, Antonio Brown is suspended through week 15 for violating COVID protocols. If you recall a couple of weeks ago, there was some, some buzz about maybe him submitting a fake COVID vaccination card. It turns out that lo looks to be a an actual fact as opposed to an allegation. It doesn't look like Antonio Brown is appealing that suspension. So he will be out through week 15. So he'll be able to rest that ankle injury a little bit longer, obviously. Um, as And by the way, I think that is kind of a, a hit to Tom Brady. And, and when we talk about the five touchdowns he, he threw in week two, that was with Antonio Brown, if, if memory serves. I don't think yep. he was injured for that game. So I do think Antonio Brown really opens up the offense. Nonetheless, I love Tom Brady in this game. He's definitely going to be, if we'll see, you know, when we get to the end of the show, likely my favorite stack. I like Tom Brady to Rob Gronkowski, but just like last week, I like Tom Brady, Godwin, Gronkowski stacks, and I think you could kind of alternate that with Mike Evans. If I had to choose one I, I favor, it's Godwin over Evans. But uh, I absolutely like Tom Brady here with uh, either a stack with Rob Gronkowski, Chris Godwin, or both of them. All right. Uh, as of now, Fournette, Godwin, and Gronk all checking in at 11% ownership or higher, uh, according to the projections that we get from Mike. Uh, Jacob, anything that you wanted to add on the Tampa Bay side of things in terms of stacking the game? No, I'll, I think you definitely, if you're making multiple lineups, need to get some exposure to Brady and, you know, Evans or Godwin or Gronk, whatever your uh, preference is, because we could see, you know, four or five touchdowns. But no, I, see, did you say you had somebody from Atlanta that you're bringing it back with? I'm curious who that is. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the obvious play would be Patterson just because he's seeing increased snaps, but also like a ton of usage when he's actually on the field. The guy I kind of want to bring it back with that I don't think many people are going to play at all is Russell Gage. If you actually look at his target distribution over the last two games, it's pretty good and he's been pretty efficient with it. His target share is 25% over the last two games. So with all that focus being on Kyle Pitts and a little bit being on Cordell Patterson, Russell Gage is getting open looks and he's getting open, particularly in man coverage. So I think Russell Gage is, is a really kind of interesting bring back. If this game is somewhat competitive and, and Atlanta does have a 20 point implied total, 19.75 technically. So, you know, that's going to go somewhere probably to Patterson. But if you don't want to pay the 7K or if you want to double stack it, double correlate it back, I think Russell Gage is definitely in play. 
Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, if you're spending up for Tom Brady and his weapons, you need to save money. And, and Russell Gage is only 5,300 on DraftKings. So uh, I don't think that's a bad play at all. He scored a touchdown last week. Let's move on to the Vikings at the Lions. The Vikings are seven-point favorites with a 46.5 point total. Dalvin Cook not at Thursday's practice and more than likely going to miss this game here in week 13. Patrick Peterson was placed on the COVID list Monday. He is vaccinated, so still has a chance to play this week. We'll see. Uh, how that shakes out. Anthony Barr and uh, Christian Darasaw did not practice. Rashad Breeland, Mackenzie Alexander, Sheldon Richardson, and Eric Kendrick Kendricks were all limited for the Vikings. On the Lions side of things, DeAndre Swift did not practice dealing with that shoulder injury. Sounds like he'll miss a few games here. Uh, Trey Flowers also did not practice. Panay Sewell was back at practice Thursday after missing Wednesday's practice uh we've got a battle of backup running backs here with alexander madison priced all the way up to 7600 i think it's very appropriate given his projected role in the offense and uh, jamal williams much more reasonably priced at 5400 uh currently projecting as two of the top six highest owned players on the slate uh jacob what are you thinking about each of these guys madison and jamal williams yeah, I think they're both terrific plays. Um, Williams, I, I was a little discouraged to see that his route involvement was only 61%. So 61% of the time that Detroit dropped back to pass last week after the Swift injury, um, did he actually get to run a route? Um, Swift's has typically been around like 75 to 80, 85%, which is like the best in the NFL. Um, and if we see Williams in that type of role, his receiving projection would be really, really exciting. because He's actually been targeted at a higher rate when running routes than Swift has, which is nuts. Um, that's coming a small sample size, so take it for what it's worth. Um, but still, I think there's potential for five plus targets if Detroit has to go pass heavy. And if they don't, I actually think that they could find success on the ground here. Uh, the Vikings are one of just two teams that have allowed over two yards before contact per rushing attempt. Um, they're ranked 29th in rush defense DVOA. And Detroit's line has actually been really, really solid at creating yards before contact. We saw Swift really excel in that area last year. And both he and uh, Williams have really just racked up yards before contact this year as well. And so I really am into him here, and I, I I think one of my favorite. I get. I'll just wait. We'll get into the tournament <laughs> stacks later. But I really like bringing back with Justin Jefferson. If you do expect to try to like maybe keep it competitive and be able to control the game on the ground a little bit, like I don't know. I, it's it's a weird play, but I think it could pay off. And Williams is just so cheap. No, I, I totally get it too. Cause I said on Tuesday's podcast, like this just seems like a spot where Justin Jefferson could go absolutely ballistic, oh, right? Yeah. Like if he wants to, if, if they are a little bit more pass happy uh, now that Dalvin cook is dealing with the injury, we mentioned before uh, earlier in the season, Mike talked about this where uh, basically whenever Dalvin cook is out of the lineup, they kind of have a little bit more freedom to open up the offense and, and throw the ball a little bit more. So if they choose to do that, I think Justin Jefferson could be in an absolute smash spot here. Uh, oh, yeah. The Vikings, by the way, checking in with the fourth highest implied team total, on the slate and uh see what are you thinking about getting some Kirk Cousins stacks in here uh, on the Viking side of things I absolutely love it I love the Justin Jefferson play like Jacob uh, so obviously a lot of people are going to look to Madison I mean he's priced up a little bit I, I think people prefer him to be lower but people are certainly going to play him and and Jamal Williams of course but I I really like it in tournaments specifically uh, kind of, I don't want to say ignoring Madison, but if you're trying to take down a GPP, you, you're trying to get different. You're trying to get off chalk a little bit, obviously. I think a Cousins to Jefferson stack makes so much sense. You could include Madison in that if you want to. Uh, that that certainly has potential. Or you could double stack it with Adam Thielen, who we know is a monster with respect to touchdowns. But if I just had to pick one guy with a Kirk Cousins stack, I agree it's Justin Jefferson. And yeah, I, I think bringing it back with Jamal Williams is great if you want to bring it back with somebody. Uh, I also think Josh Reynolds is definitely in play uh, over the last two games he's getting targets i mean the, the target distribution is kind of even among all the receivers but his a dot is higher um his air yards are certainly more uh, and i think we're starting to see him get more comfortable with his old teammate jared goff so at 3400 especially if you're stacking this game uh, i think you could double stack it back with uh, jamal williams or josh reynolds or just get off J jamal williams and just take a flyer on josh reynolds you know what I think is so interesting this week, Sia? You, you spoke about uh, potentially getting different and getting off of Alexander Madison. I just don't know where all of the running back ownership is going to go this week because we have so many plays. Like, there's so many guys. Madison, Jamal Williams, Elijah Mitchell, 
Jonathan Taylor, obviously in a great spot. James Conner, I think people are going to still want to play mm -hmm. him. We have Antonio Gibson. So, I mean, you can only play three running backs in a lineup. I think it's going to be really interesting to see where ownership settles uh, on running backs this upcoming week. Uh, That's true. And, and let me say this, because we said this a few weeks ago when when there was a lot of value at running back. And, and there there certainly is this week with Conner, like 5,900, I believe. Gibson's a great value at 5,700. We have Jamal Williams. If you really want to get different, pay for two high-end running backs because people will be rostering Jonathan Taylor, but most likely they'll take like Taylor or Eckler or Mixon, and then they'll just drop down to the values of like Gibson or Connor or Williams or who, or maybe Sony Michelle if he ends up uh, being the starter in that Rams game. So if you really want to get different, you can start with two elite running backs, and you're probably going to be different than most of the field because most people will probably only roster one. Yeah, I mean, you could easily go, or not easily, but you could spend up for Jonathan Taylor and Joe Mixon, something like that, and then mm -hmm. you know play a bunch of wide receiver value. Maybe even play someone like Josh Reynolds. I, I like that call mm -hmm. quite a bit. See, at 3,400, scored a touchdown last week, 20% uh, target share in that game, obviously has the rapport with Jared Goff as well. Before we move on to the next game, Mike is a big fan of both running backs in this game. Let's find out why. Heading over to the running back spot, it's very simple. Williams, DeAndre Swift is going to be out for a few weeks. All aboard on Jamal Williams at 5,400. Alexander Madison, I like him despite the price point being pretty appropriate. He's going to see heavy usage in this one. And then Boston Scott for the Philadelphia Eagles looks like they're going to have some of their running backs here banged up. They have a bye week after this, after the Jets. I think they're conservative with Miles Sanders. So Fire away on Boston Scott. And then James Conner, like the spot, as he, you know, Edmonds is not going to be returning here, should have all the workload he can handle. And then same thing to be true with Eli Mitchell of the San Francisco 49ers with Debo Samuel out. He's going to be in my player pool as well. Uh, he did record that before we got the news about Boston Scott, Miles Sanders. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to that game. But uh, looking like Miles Sanders might actually play this week. So uh, maybe get away from Boston Scott. But everyone else that Mike mentioned, I think, is, is in play. Uh, this upcoming week. Let's move on to the Colts at the Texans. The Colts are 10 point favorites with a 45 and a half point total. Quentin Nelson, DeForest Buckner, Darius Leonard, and Jack Doyle all return to practice on Thursday after sitting out Wednesday for the Indianapolis Colts. And then on the Texans side of things, Brandon Cooks, David Johnson, and Chris Conley all out of practice Thursday with a non COVID illness. Danny Amendola did not practice with a knee injury. Let's talk about the highest priced player on both sides. That is Jonathan Taylor, who is also projecting for the highest ownership as of now. He has 95 or more scrimmage yards and a touchdown in nine straight games. The guy is just unbelievable. Leads the NFL with 70 red zone opportunities. I mentioned earlier, Leonard Fournette is second with 51. That is a massive, massive difference. We're like 19 red zone opportunities. That is crazy. So Jonathan Taylor's workload is just insane. Uh, we know that this is a great matchup going up against the Houston Texans here. Uh, Jacob, what are you thinking about uh, Jonathan Taylor? I mean, he's he's great, but he's also really expensive too. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love him for tournaments, and I think it. Uh, what Sia just said about you know paying up at running backs makes a lot of sense. And just real quick on if you are paying up for running backs, you're probably going to include Josh Reynolds. I would assume. And I just wanted to mention over the last two weeks he has 71 percent of Detroit's air yards. It's the highest in the NFL. It's not even close. He's a 71 percent air yards. It's just silly. Um, but yeah, I I love the spot for Jonathan Taylor. There's really not a lot to say other than like when everyone seems to be kind of concentrate on one similar type of roster build it just makes sense to deviate from that especially when it's a great player in a great matchup you know don't ever think it <laughs> yeah yeah and I, I mentioned i built a cast lineup you know see if i stick with that but it, it didn't have jonathan taylor in it so a lot mm. of running back value this week you need to decide what you want to do uh, i do like some of those mid-tier wide receivers quite a bit uh see i'm not really in love with anything else in this game i, I think you know if you want to get different by playing carson wentz with two of his weapons you know Pittman is 5,700. T.Y. Hilton, 4,400 on DraftKings. Loves facing the Houston Texans. We know that. <laughs> Jack Doyle is 3,300. He's coming off a massive game, and it's a really good matchup against this Houston Texans defense. Uh, do you like anything else in this game outside of Jonathan Taylor? You know, it's funny. On Tuesday, I did mention Carson Wentz as a potential you know, stackable component, but the, the pace at which the Colts play and the fact that they're just going to lean on Jonathan Taylor as they make this legitimate playoff push – I don't think I can really come around there. I think if you wanted to take a piece and you needed the money, you needed the cash, I think T.Y. Hilton at 4,400 on DraftKings makes sense. Uh, we talked about, or Frank, you specifically talked about it 
on Tuesday in terms of what T.Y. Hilton does against the Houston Texans. You know, he's only had a couple games back from his injury. He scored a touchdown last week. Not a, not a ton of yards, only a handful. But I think that's interesting. And, and I do have to mention Jack Doyle, who was really great last week. He had a touchdown, uh, almost 100 yards. I believe he had six catches. He's only 3,300. He's clearly the number one tight end, whereas before we really weren't sure how much work Mo Ali Cox was going to get, you know, four to six games ago. It's pretty clear now that Jack Doyle is, is a – main target of Carson Wentz. So that's just somebody to consider if you want to maybe pivot off of Foster Moreau or O'Shaughnessy at a tight end. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point because Foster Moreau's ownership is going to be massive this week. So if you want to pivot and and get a little bit different there, again, it's a really good matchup there for Jack Doyle. If uh, David Johnson is out in this game, Rex Burkhead is only 4,800. So worth mentioning, probably give you like 20 touches for 40 yards. It's not very exciting, obviously, but Hey, 20 touches is 20 touches. Jacob, anything else you'd like to add to this game, Texans and Colts? At first glance, I like Brandon Cooks. He's a little bit underpriced and performs well against zone, and uh, Andy uses a ton of zone, but I think wide receiver is deep enough that you really don't need to go there. Yep. Uh, Last thing I'll point out, the Colts are a little bit beat up right now. They have a week 14 bye. I think they just want to get in here, handle business. They're going to run the ball a ton and leave. I don't know that they're going to try and get crazy here. I don't know that they want to pass the ball and, and try and get into a shootout. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I was going to say, if you are going to play Brandon Cooks, it would certainly make sense to play him with Tyrod Taylor and just hope that that stack just ends up paying off. It would be a cheap stack at that with Tyrod being 5,300 on DraftKings. Obviously, you can bring it back with Jonathan Taylor there. So I actually mentioned Tyrod just kind of loosely on Tuesday. If you're if you're in like a huge GPP, like 150 entry per person field, I think a, a Tyrod Cook stack and bringing it back with maybe one or two uh, guys makes sense. Otherwise, I don't think it's worth it on that on that Houston side of the ball. All right. The Eagles are at the Jets this week. The Eagles are seven point favorites with a 45 point total here and lots going on. No Jason Kelsey, Jordan Howard or or Boston Scott at Thursday's practice. Uh, Scott is dealing with an illness. Devontae Smith returned to practice. Jalen Hurts said that he'll be good to go on Sunday and a little surprise here. Miles Sanders also said that he plans to play. So he's dealing with an ankle injury earlier on in the week. We thought, you know, there was no chance he was going to play. Uh, they don't really need to push him. I believe the Eagles have a week 14 buy as well. So, uh, but it sounds like he, he's actually going to play on the Jets side of things. Corey Davis did not practice again on Thursday, dealing with that groin injury and two of their defensive tackles, Sheldon Rankins and Foley uh, Fatu Kasi did not practice on Thursday. Uh, the Eagles running back situation, it's kind of in flux, uh, but see, uh, Jacob, we'll start with you this time. Uh, what do you think in here? Uh, I don't like. I just don't love this game in general either much. I I was interested in the running backs, but now that Miles Sanders is back, it's just I don't know. This game's pretty meh. Yeah, I will definitely be going back to Jalen Hurts in tournaments. I think people are going to be off him a little bit, and I honestly think you could go there and cash if you really wanted to. I think uh, the rushing floor is there, assuming that he's not you know too banged up. Is assuming he's as healthy as he claims to be. Um, the Jets have allowed the most yards before contact per rush, and Jalen Hurts leads the entire NFL in yards before contact per rush. Uh, they also rank dead last in DVOA against the pass, so it's definitely a good matchup for him if you still have any trust in him after what we've seen lately. Um, but yeah, no running backs on the Philly side. I do really like Elijah Moore in this spot. He's just so good, and if Corey Davis is out again, he's going to run around and almost every drop back, and he's being targeted at a really, really high rate. Um, so it's not a good matchup, but if you just want a volume play and a really good player who's cheap, I think he makes some sense, and he's not going to have any ownership. Yeah, yeah, he is 5,500 on DraftKings. The problem, I you know, I watched the entire Jets Texans game last week. Why would you just, do that? <laughs> oh my gosh! I'm a Jets fan, Jacob. So I, I want to <laughs> see any sign of hope for Zach Wilson. There was nothing. He like he's man. I don't know. I don't know what the future holds for him. Like, but he did not look good. Uh, the one thing I'll say, it was a season high in terms of snaps for Elijah Moore. So you like to see that 88 percent of the snaps, and he saw a 35 percent target share in that game. The problem is those targets are coming from Zach Wilson. See ya. What do you think? Uh, Jalen Hurts, obviously, look, Jets defense has been pretty bad all season long. Uh, I think if you want to get different and, and stack him with someone like Devontae Smith or or Dallas Goddard in, in a larger field contest, I, I think that that is definitely in play. Uh, and then if you wanted to bring it back with Elijah Moore, that's that's a possibility for you. So what are you thinking here? This is so interesting because I pretty much ignored this game. But when Jacob just talked about, hey, you know, people are down on Jalen Hurts and then he has his injury. People don't necessarily want to buy into a guy that might, you know, have a or an aggravation of that injury pop up. It's why this is such a good tournament play, right? So I'm almost mad at myself for ignoring it. I think if you're making, let's say, eight to 10 lineups, and I'm just throwing that out casually, 
I think one of them should be Jalen Hurts to Devontae Smith with or without a bring back. I don't think you have to bring it back, but Elijah Moore certainly makes sense. He would be the only guy I would bring it back with. And I think he's certainly price conscious at 5,500 on DraftKings. So yeah, I think a Jalen Hurts, Devontae Smith uh, in, with an Elijah Moore bring back, it's pretty cost effective and it makes a lot of sense. So you might look at the total and you think, oh, it's only 45 points. That, that's not as sexy as the 48 or the 50 and a half. Well, the implied total is almost 26 for Philly, which is pretty much up there. So that's something to consider. You might not like the total, but if you're stacking the right side of it with the high implied total, you're probably going to be in good shape. So I, I definitely will have at least one of my single entry three max lineups uh, with that Jalen Hurts, Devontae Smith stack. Yeah, and I think it's okay to, if you're playing Hurts with Devontae Smith, you can run those chalk running backs out there because I just don't think that that, that stack is right. going to be very popular this week. So I think you're already different enough, enough there where if you wanted to go with like the Gibsons and the Elijah Mitchells and James Connors, like you're, you're totally fine doing that. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the uh, the Cardinals at the Bears. The Cardinals are seven and a half point favorites with a 44 point total. Kyler Murray and DeAndre Hopkins were limited at practice again Thursday. Ian Rappaport said both will be back this week here in week 13. Guard Justin Pugh uh, did not practice here on Thursday. For the Bears, Justin Fields was limited. Allen Robinson, Cole Komet, Marquise Goodwin, and Roquan Smith all did not practice. Dealing with some weather here, so let's pay attention to that as we get closer to Sunday. Uh, currently projecting 39 degrees, some light rain, 15 miles per hour, uh, five mile per hour wind. So that's not great there. See, we'll start with you. Uh, is it just the running backs are bust here? Because look, I'm if you want to throw a tournament lineup out there with like Kyler and DeAndre Hopkins, I think it's going to be very, very low owned. But I mean, just from a realistic uh, projection stand standpoint, I just don't know how great it is to do something like that. So, yeah. So, you know, the last thing I want to do is say, hey, take a shot here and take a shot here. So it's it's good that we came off the Philly New York Jets game, because if I'm comparing the two and I'm like, well, I have to decide I can't make a thousand lineups. Kyler Murray to D hop stack or Jalen Hurts to Devontae Smith with, with Smith with my, my last line or my last two lineups. It's definitely going to be Jalen Hurts to Devontae Smith. So that's the winner of those two if you're debating them. But I agree with you. Yeah, it's it's the running backs. James Conner makes a lot of sense. I mean, Kyler makes sense. I don't know that you have to play him with D hop. You could probably roll them out naked or maybe with James Conner and just hope that they both get there. It's at Chicago. Kyler's first game back. It doesn't instill a ton of confidence. There's so many pass catchers. I mean, Hopkins, AJ Green, Christian Kirk, Rondale Moore, Zach Ertz, even, even Wesley is getting some runs. So it's really hard to consider how you want to stack that. And on the other side, David Montgomery, he hasn't been very efficient, but He's getting all the work, so he certainly makes sense. He's only 5,600. I don't think he's going to be quite as chalky as some of the other running backs we've talked about. So he may be a nice pivot off of, you know, the Elijah Mitchells, the Antonio Gibsons, Jamal Williams of the world. That That's where I'm going in this game, and that's it. Jacob, I think if I'm choosing between Kyler Murray and Hopkins, I, I don't know that you have to play them both together. I might just play DeAndre Hopkins and see what he does. He's just so cheap. 6,200 over on DraftKings. Uh, if you wanted to do some kind of like mini correlation with him and Darnell Mooney, uh, Mooney is 5,600. He has 100 yards or a touchdown in three straight games. Leads the team with a 27% target share. Personally, I'm not expecting Allen Robinson to return in this game. So, uh, Jacob, what do you think about anyone in the pass game here uh, and your thoughts on the running backs as well? I probably won't have any Hopkins. If I were going to choose one of those two receivers for tournaments, it would be Mooney. Um, he has a freaking 34% target share and 46% air yard share in the two games without um, without Allen Robinson, which is just ridiculous. Um, I will say Arizona like really emphasizes taking away deep passing, um, and they've been really good at it. And so it's possible that he sees a bunch of empty air yards and just doesn't produce. And honestly, like if you want to just kind of go down the Jack Doyle-esque play here at tight end, just taking a cheap tight end who's cheap, Cole Komet's running a ton of routes, and we finally saw him be targeted at a high rate. And he's playing a defense that funnels everything to the short intermediate area of the field. So, like, it makes sense that he would be targeted at a high rate in this game. Um, I never want to advise anyone to play Cole Komet, <laughs> <laughs> like, especially when we have cheap tight ends. But, like, you, you'll, you'll get him at almost no ownership. Um, but, yeah, really just not much interest in the pass catchers here. What about yeah, can I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What about the run game, Jacob? Oh, definitely. James Conner is a terrific play, one of many. Um, I, I Especially on, on DraftKings, he's just way too cheap. Um, and I think he may go a little bit overlooked, but because there are so many plays, so I, I'm definitely going to have a lot of Conner, especially in tournaments. Yeah, I, I am interested to see what the target share is going to be with Kyler Murray as the quarterback, because he was getting a, a ton of targets with Colt McCoy, but obviously yeah. a completely different quarterback than Kyler. What were you going to say, Zia? 
It was, it's funny what Jacob said about Cole Komet because I've been on the same train. Like I haven't played him all season. I think I said that specific phrase on Tuesday, but it is hard to ignore. Just last game, 11 targets. He caught eight of them. Jimmy Graham somehow is getting some touchdown work. But again, like I said on Tuesday, that's going to regress towards Cole Komet at some point, maybe even this game, particularly with how Jacob was describing how that Arizona secondary funnels the uh, short area passing. So Cole Komet is, is, I think, a pretty sharp play this week. All right, you want to play against us over on DraftKings this week? You can do just that. We have a $5 contest, 150 entries. The top 15 gets paid out. The link is in the podcast and the YouTube description. Jacob, I want to see you in there as well this week. So uh, send you the link. We'll get you in. But again, uh, you can find that wherever you're listening, watching this, if you want to play against us this upcoming week. Let's take a quick break. We've got six games down. We've got five more to go. We'll do it here. Fantasy Football Today, DFS. All right, we've got the Giants at the Dolphins. The Dolphins are four-point favorites with a 40.5-point total, the lowest on the main slate. Everybody's hurt for the New York Giants. Daniel Jones, Sterling Shepard, and Kyle Rudolph all limited in practice. Kadarius Toney, Adoree Jackson, John Ross, Caden Smith did not practice for the Giants on Thursday. And then on the Dolphins side, Devontae Parker back at practice. Sounds like he's got a, a pretty good chance to play uh, this weekend. Philip Lindsay did not practice. Adam Shaheen was limited. All right, let's move on to the next game. No, nah, just like really not interested <laughs> in, in this game at all. Uh, see, I'll throw it to you first. Like if there's anything that I'm looking at, it's the Dolphin side. Jalen Waddle, 6,400. It's just the price tag is getting up there. I get it. He's been really, really good, uh, but it's starting to climb. Miles Gaskin, we have a lot of running backs in that range, so it just doesn't really excite me that much. Maybe Devontae Parker, 3,900 if he plays, but it's really just the Giants. Or, or, uh, the Dolphins are nothing for me. Yeah, specifically the Dolphins defense. That's probably the only thing I'm in favor of. Um, I don't have the fan duel pricing in front of me, but there are 3,300 on DraftKings, which is more expensive than we like to play uh, defenses. But there's not a lot of good punt defenses this week. At Washington's 2,500. I think that's a little puntish, but they've certainly been playing well, and I think they can turn Derek Carr over. Uh, with that said, that will be kind of the more punt defense I'll play with, but I'm going to try to pay up the 3300 for the Dolphins defense. So uh, that's really the only, like, yeah, Jalen Waddle's fine. I mean, the price is getting up there. His stock is obviously pretty high right now, so that's not usually when I want to dive in on somebody, especially in a game that I'm actually surprised the way the Dolphins are playing. I'm surprised they're only favored by four. I think this could get away from the Giants. Yeah, look, Jalen Waddle, 61 yards or more in six of his last seven games, had that massive game last week against the Panthers secondary, which is actually really good. Uh, I actually don't mind the Giants defense here, 2,700. They've played pretty well. They keep the Giants in games at times. And if you're just looking for someone cheaper, I know you just mentioned to you, like there's not a lot of cheap defense this week. Giants, I think, are okay at 2,700. Uh, Jacob, what do you think about this game? Giants-Dolphins. Uh, first, I just wanted to, you know, commend you for like immediately transitioning to the like jo join the listener league after we advocated playing Cole Komet. Because like, if you're anyone who's listening, and you hear that, you're like, yeah, I'll get in, I'll beat you guys if you're playing Cole Komet. <laughs> and on that note, I have another really gross play. It's Sterling Shepard. Um, he's just way too cheap. Obviously, we don't know exactly what the role is going to be. We don't know who the quarterback is going to be. There's a lot of unknown, um, but. We do know that throughout his career, um, and especially this year, it's really been accentuated. Sterling Shepard has been targeted at a just ridiculous rate when he's been facing man coverage, and the Dolphins use man more than any, any defense in the NFL. Um, so for his career, he's been targeted on 28% of his routes versus man compared to 18% for his zone. That's a massive discrepancy for a career average. In 2021, this is a really small sample size, but Sterling Shepard has been targeted on 44% of his routes run against man coverage, which is just absurd. Um, and then the other thing is, Versus the Blitz, he's been targeted on 37% of his routes, which is third behind only Cooper Cup and Deontay Johnson. And the Dolphins also blitz at the NFL's highest rate. Um, so there's obviously a lot of volatility here with the projection. Who knows if the Giants are even going to have 150 yards passing on the day. Um, but at the price point, no ownership. I, I actually like Sterling Shepard a lot just because of the schematic matchup here. Yeah, he's 4,900, so he, he's very cheap uh, over on DraftKings. And we know the Dolphins have really strong cornerbacks outside, and typically Sterling Shepard lines up in the slot. So I, I guess that does further feeds into the point that you're making here, Jacob, uh, regarding that Dolphins defense. Let's move on to the afternoon games. The Washington football team at the Raiders. The Raiders are two-and-a-half-point favorites with a 49-and-a-half-point total here. And for Washington, J.D. McKissick, Landon Collins, Eric Flowers did not practice on Thursday. Antonio Gibson, Curtis Samuel, Brandon Scherf, Logan Thomas were all limited. For the Raiders, Darren Waller, Deshaun Jackson, Carl Nassib did not practice Thursday. 
Darren Waller looking more doubtful that he's going to play uh, this upcoming week. Fun game. Third highest total on the slate. All eyes, I believe, are going to be on Antonio Gibson here, who just posted career highs in carries with 29 and receptions with seven on Monday Night Football. It's not looking good for J.D. McKissick as well. Uh, see, we have all those running backs in that kind of mid-tier. Uh, Gibson is 5,700. He is on DK, he's 6,200 on FanDuel. How do you rank that group? Connor, Eli Mitchell, Gibson, Jamal Williams. I would go Gibson, Jamal Williams, Elijah Mitchell, and then Connor. I think that's the four you gave me, but it's it's actually like really close among the four. I think Gibson is in line for such a, a, a giant workload, and it's mostly because they don't really have any other options. They're obviously going to promote somebody from the practice squad because J.D. McKissick, you know, spoiler alert, he's definitely not playing. Jared Patterson really isn't like a third down back. So they're going to be using Gibson for, for the full complement of downs, as far as I can see. And they've been doing that anyway. I think he had seven targets last week and caught all seven of them. And he had a, obviously a handful of carries too. So I just think Gibson's in, in for such a good workload. And this is a Washington team that is very motivated. They're unfortunately for Gibson, I mean, until the wheels fall off. Because that they need Gibson, they need to win every single game, and Gibson, I think, is going to be the key to get them there. So uh, I probably like him the most, and he's probably the main piece I like in this game uh, on the Washington side. It's not a game I'm necessarily going to stack. I think Logan Thomas at 4K is another interesting tight end pivot because not only does he get targets, you know, he's only had one full game back. Not only does he get targets, but he gets high quality targets as well. And I know Taylor Heineke is going to be looking his way uh, if and when they're in the red zone. So uh, those are the two pieces I like the most. Yeah. And Logan Thomas should have had a touchdown last week as well. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that further feeds into those high quality targets there in the red zone. I, I don't mind the, the Raiders passing attack here in this spot. Obviously, we know Washington... Uh, football defense has struggled all year in, in terms of defending the pass. Uh, and Hunter Renfro right now has a 22% target share since week nine, coming off that massive game on Thanksgiving. Derek Carr is very affordable at 6K. And then no Waller would just mean, you know, mega chalk on Foster Moreau, who is just 2,700. Had that big game the last time Darren Waller was out, had the opportunity, uh, 60 yards and a touchdown there. Jacob, what do you think about the Raiders passing attack here in the spot? Yeah, I think uh, Mike pointed out Derek Carr is just a really good value um, and you can really get cheap exposure to this game. So I think it's going to be popular and with good reason. Um, I'm going to have Foster Moreau in all my cash game lineups, um, assuming that he is drawing the start. I just expect him to fill obviously not the, the target type of role that Darren Waller did, but the, the route involvement was similar to what Darren Waller was running when we did see Foster Moreau draw a start early in the season. So I will be going there for sure. And then, yeah, if Gibson... If McKissick is out, Gibson's like clearly the best out of that group. I think if McKissick is out, Gibson projects almost as well as like Najee Harris, Leonard Fournette, and people like that. It's really, I think he's just like an every lineup smash play if if McKissick is out, which it seems like he's going to be. Yep, yep, I like that as well. Uh, see, I just wanted to ask you regarding Foster Moreau. Uh, assuming Darren Waller is out, is this like a free square in all formats, or maybe look to fade him and, and gain some leverage? Yeah, I think he's a free square in cash, but in GPP, I think there's so many other options that could have similar like viability, similar targets, uh, similar points that I think he's not necessarily a lock, especially if he's going to be as popular as we project. We talked about O'Shaughnessy. We talked about maybe paying up a little bit for, uh, who was it? Well, Logan Thomas was one of them in this game, but uh, let's see. It was, there was somebody Jack at 3,600. Jack Doyle was 3,300. There was somebody at 3,600 we talked about. Obviously, Gronk is in play too in those, in those Tom Brady stacks, or even if you're not stacking Tom Brady, I think. He's in play. O'Shaughnessy, of course, in play. There's a lot to pivot from, is my point. So yeah, Foster Moreau in cash, he makes a ton of sense. I'll be playing him in cash. But in GPP, just a touch of him, I'll be going a lot of different directions at tight end. All right. The Jaguars are at the Rams. The Rams are 13-point favorites with a 48-point total here. And for the Jaguars, cornerback Shaq Griffin and linebacker Miles Jack did not practice on Thursday. James Robinson was limited. And for the Rams, uh, Daryl Henderson did not practice with a thigh injury. Odell Beckham limited with a hip. Much like the Bucks, the Rams are rocking the second highest implied team total, but are double digit favorites here in this spot. Uh, and I think Ram stacks are interesting because uh, everything went to those three wide receivers and Daryl Henderson last week. Four players accounted for 33 of their 39 targets. And uh, Beckham was actually tied with Cooper Cup for the team lead with 10 targets last week. And there's a huge difference in price. So I don't know if that's going to remain the case this week, but uh, Odell Beckham 
$3,500 less than Cooper Cup in this spot. Jacob, we'll start with you. Uh, what do you think about stacking the Rams? And if you are, uh, which of those Rams pass catchers do you like most? Yeah, I think we're, we're thinking the same way about it here. I, I definitely like stacking Stafford with Beckham. I think this is a bounce back spot for those guys. Um, I also like Van Jefferson as kind of an uh, overlooked tournament play. He really saw just excellent volume last week. Um, and I think Henderson is in play as well. He's somebody I was really, really liking early in the week. But um, now that we have so many running back plays, I think he maybe will go a, a little bit overlooked. Um, it is worth noting that Jacksonville like really, really, really emphasizes stopping a run. For some reason, they have the highest uh, like stacked box rate of any team in the NFL. Um, I don't know why they, they just let people pass on them. So you honestly might on a, the, a slate with so many good running back plays, you might be better off just avoiding Henderson and focus on the passing game. Yeah. And you know, that makes me think more. And I mentioned this on Tuesday's podcast here that the Rams need a win. They they're, they're kind of desperate here at this mm -hmm. point. And this just looks like a spot where look, if Jacksonville is stacking the box, Stafford's just going to eat. And, and he ha has the wide receivers to be able to do that too. Obviously with Cooper cup and Odell Beckham look pretty damn good. We've got a, you know, make sure that he's healthy going into that game. Van Jefferson, you know, had one. Uh, did he have a touchdown last week? Should have had two touchdowns, I believe it was. But uh, yeah, I think that this is a spot where uh, Matthew Stafford could just have a massive game. What are you thinking here, Sia? Uh, everyone here. There are some cheaper punt plays, too, on the Jaguar side of things. Treadwell, uh, James O'Shaughnessy, those guys are super cheap. Wow, you left out Tavon Austin. That's not cool. I think he had a touchdown last week. Um, so yeah, this is it like your classic cliche, you know, get right game, right? And and I, I think it th there's validity to it at home. They haven't been good. They've obviously lost a few in a row. Uh, I think Matt Stafford to Cooper Cup from a stack standpoint makes sense. But I agree, Van Jefferson and Odell Beckham are all in play. It's just a matter of how you want to play it, where you want to spend your money. Very interesting on on the the Daryl Henderson Sony Michelle thing in terms of Jag stacking the box. Um, you know, I guess, I guess we should proceed with caution if Daryl Henderson is out of this game. I, I think he's going to play, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Sony Michelle at 4,300, if Daryl Henderson is out, I don't know that I'll be able to resist that, especially given the, the point spread here. I mean, I think at some point in this game, they're going to be up so much that they're probably going to be feeding uh, Sony Michelle more often than not. But again, that's, I'm talking about a couple contingencies that would need to come in to make Sony Michelle a smart play there. But, uh, yeah, I like the stack as far as the bring back. You know, James Robinson obviously is a little banged up. We don't know where he's at. If, if Carlos Hyde ends up playing, he's only 4,200, and he's not going to be he's not going to be doing much against the Rams from a running standpoint. But maybe he catches enough passes to justify the the play at 4,200. Outside of that, I don't think I can go to any of the pass catchers. O'Shaughnessy is interesting, but to to your point and Jacob's point, it's probably going to be more Foster Moreau than it's going to be O'Shaughnessy for me. By the way, the running uh, the tight end I was thinking of that was 3,600. It's the very forgettable Cole Komet. I, I, I have this thing where I just don't play him, and apparently I can't remember his name either. That's who I was thinking of at 3,600. Yeah, I, look, I'm not going to fault you for, for not remembering Cole Komet. See ya. That's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, all right, let's move on to the 49ers at the Seahawks. The 49ers are three-point favorites with a 45-and-a-half point total. Debo Samuel out one to two weeks with that groin injury. And for the Seahawks, DK Metcalf, Alex Collins, Rashad Penny, all limited in practice. Lots of excitement around Elijah Mitchell and Brandon Ayuk this week, and rightfully so. Uh, Mitchell is 6K on DraftKings. He just had 32 touches last week, uh, including five receptions. That's back-to-back -back games with 27 carries. Uh, has exactly five receptions in two of his last three. Brandon Ayuk leads the team with a 24% target share since week nine when George Kittle returned to the team. Uh, Jacob, I like both of those guys. I think they're going to be pretty chalky here with uh, Mitchell and Brandon Ayuk. Yeah, I think they're both. I mean, I think you hit on both of them as being pretty solid plays, but uh, not guys you you have to fit in. Um, they're, they're a little bit underpriced. I'm curious what you guys think about George Kittle. I think he's somebody who's going to just fly under the radar a little bit because everybody loves those two plays, and Kittle hasn't been seeing a ton of targets lately. Um, but Seattle plays a ton of zone, and George Kittle, his discrepancy between man and zone splits are just massive. I was trying to pull it up, but I don't have it quite up. Yeah, it's up from 18% target per route run rate all the way up to 28% versus zone um, compared to man. Um, and Seattle plays zone at the third highest rate. They're another defense that just kind of keeps everything in front of them. So I could see it being more of a Kittle game, whereas we've seen how you could target a lot more lately. Um, and with everyone paying down at tight end, it's just another way to kind of differentiate your rosters this week. Yeah, I, I don't mind it as just a one-off, right? Like, I don't even think you need any kind of mini stack, but if you want to get different in tournaments, George Kittle at 5,900. The uh, I think the price is fair, especially given that Debo Samuel is out here. Uh, when it comes to the Seahawks side of things, 
I just don't think DK Metcalf is healthy right now. He's dealing with this foot injury. He said last week, like, it's not a big deal. I don't know. I kind of think of, yeah, I kind of think it's a, a deal. Maybe it's not a big deal, but it, it's there. Um, he's 6,700. Tyler Lockett, 6,500. Russell Wilson, not himself right now. I don't know. See, what do you think? George Kittle, Jacob brought him up. Like him? Yeah, we, we, we mentioned him Tuesday too. I think this is like a perfect sort of contrarian-ish play because everybody's going to want to pay down for tight end this week. And George Kittle's just sitting there. We don't, we're not going to have Debo. So people are going to slide to Brandon Ayuk for good reason, right? Well, what about not playing Brandon Ayuk and playing George Kittle? How much leverage do you have on the field at that point? Probably quite a bit. So uh, obviously you can play Brandon Ayuk all you want, but I think George Kittle makes a, a ton of sense. I, I'm, I'll admit I'm not going to play a ton of him because I'm going to want the savings too. But I think the few lineups I have him in, and again, I'm not a max entry guy. I'm a single entry, three max uh, entry uh, GPP guy, but the few lineups I'm going to have him in, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be leveraging the field a little bit. So I'm excited about that. I think Kittle makes a ton of sense. Ayuk makes a ton of sense, probably more for cash than GPP for me. I'll play him in both though. Elijah Mitchell, of course. Uh, you're right about DK Metcalf. I mean, it's just, it. it's just, the, the first of all, the route concepts aren't very good either. I mean, he's just, he's, there, Russell Wilson just can't hit him. He's covered half the time. He's more than half the time. He's throwing to him like blanket coverage. I think Tyler Lockett makes sense from a GPP standpoint in terms of like a breaking the slate type guy. Uh, I think Lockett, we know he can get loose for a, a touchdown or two and a hundred plus yards. So he's a guy I'll be looking at in GPPs. All right. Uh, Jacob, any interest in Jawan Jennings punt down at 3,100? He scored a touchdown last week, but the snaps, the routes, they're not overly impressive. What do you think? I'd rather just buy Josh Reynolds. I, I just don't think there's any need to go there. All right. Well, uh, our last soundbite here from Mike, he likes Brandon Ayuk quite as well. So here are his favorite plays at wide receiver and tight end this upcoming week. Heading over to wide receiver makes a ton of sense if you listen to the quarterbacks and know the way that I play DFS. Keenan Allen, Deontay Johnson, Jamar Chase going to headline almost all of my lineups here. I will be mixing in Hunter Renfro, Brandon Ayuk as well. I think that they're going to be the best options for your cash and three and five max type builds. As far as GPP like leverage plays, put Jamar Chase in there as well. I'm higher than the field is going to be on him, but you can also throw in Justin Jefferson for that Kirk Cousins stack. And then I don't think anyone or enough people are talking about Marquise Brown. Love this divisional matchup against the Steelers and that awful secondary right now. Fire away on him in some tournaments. At tight end, not getting too cute here. Foster Moreau is just an absolute free square in DFS. Of course, you can make the argument for fading him. I would also make the additional argument that you don't have to fade him. You can simply play two tight ends and use him in the flex because it is truly a free square if you want to get different. But that's going to be my player pool for week 13. All right, you heard him mention Hollywood Brown. Let's wrap up with that game. The Ravens at the Steelers. The Steel, uh, the Ravens are four and a half point favorites with a 44 point total. And on the Ravens side, nine different players absent from practice on Thursday, including cornerback Marlon Humphrey. Uh, everyone on the offense looks good to go, though. Rashad Bateman, Marquise Brown, Mark Andrews, Lamar, those guys are all good. Uh, for the Steelers, cornerbacks Joe Hayden and Arthur Mollette. Did not practice Thursday. Pat Fryermuth full practice both Wednesday and Thursday, despite being in concussion protocol. So we should find out Friday uh, if he's going to clear that and be good to go here in week 13. Uh, I like Deontay Johnson quite a bit. You heard Mike talk about him. Uh, just an outstanding floor each week. He has a 31% target share since week six when Juju Smith-Schuster went down. But, Jacob, we were talking earlier this week, and you said that you love with like eight O's. <laughs> the matchup for, uh, for Chase Claypool here. Why is that? I've been hoping for the Chase Claypool breakout game for a while now, and it hasn't happened. So, like, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm feeling a little bit crazy at this point, but I think this is such a good spot for him, and I think he really is going to go off here. We'll see. But, like, Claypool, Claypool was really, really good last year. On a per-route basis, he drew targets at a higher rate than any rookie, higher than Justin Jefferson. He, was, he converted yards at a higher per-route rate than almost anyone but Justin Jefferson among the rookie class. He was really, really, really good. And we finally see him now in like an every down role. It, it got kind of disrupted by the injury, but he played 98% of snaps last week. And so like someone who's as productive as he is, as talented as he is, finally getting this opportunity, it seems like he's going to be more productive than we've seen this season. And now he gets a spot here against Baltimore that just fits perfectly the type of routes he likes to run. Baltimore uses man coverage at the third highest rate in the NFL. Um, and Chase Claypool has been 30% more likely to draw a target when facing man coverage in his career than when facing zone. Um, his yard per hour run rate is up from 1.8 to 2.5. Baltimore also has 
really been targeted downfield a lot. They have the second highest opponent um, air yards per pass attempt because they're so aggressive with this man coverage. They get up and press and teams attack them downfield. It just is, it's something that happens a lot against man coverage. And not only are teams aggressively attacking them downfield, they've really found a lot of success when doing so. They The, the Ravens have the third highest um, opponent passer rating on passes that have traveled 15 or more air yards. And so, of course, that lines up well with the type of routes that Claypool runs. Um, and then we also have just the recent wide receivers for Baltimore. Jarvis Landry went for 6-1-11 last game. Um, the game before that, Darnell Mooney was 5-1-21-1. And, and Goodwin went for 4-1-0-4-1. Um, Miami struggled against them in Week 10. But the game before that, Theon and Jefferson both found the end zone against Baltimore. And the game before that, Jamar Chase hung 8-2-0-1-1 on him. Um, and so I think it's definitely a beatable secondary and one that you know lines up really well for the type of routes that Claypool likes to run. You never know what you're going to get with Pittsburgh's offense, um, but I, I do really, really like this spot for him. I think he's still a little bit underpriced for the he's playing. Yeah, I think that last point is just the main one, right? It's just, can he get there with Big Ben as his quarterback? Yeah. Right? I mean, there's just so much of a, a, a cap on this offense right now because Ben Roethlisberger has been so bad. Uh, and it's just so weird to see a player like Chase Claypool just like, his physical build. He only has one touchdown on the season. That, that's just, that seems fluky. And it seems like at some point uh, he's got to score at least once, maybe twice. Who knows? Maybe this is the week for Chase Claypool. Uh, Jacob, I'll just go right back to here. If Pat Fryermuth is in, do we like him at 4,200? Seems like a pretty fair price tag in a really good matchup. Yeah, for sure. His role has been really good with, with Ebron out. Um, he's drawn targets at a really high rate. Um, I, I would prefer to focus more on the receivers. I don't know if I'll actually have much Fryermuth just because we mentioned a lot of tight ends, but I, I think he makes sense theoretically. All right. See, so you get the Ravens side of things and Lamar up to 7,800 over on DraftKings, the highest priced quarterback on the slate. I think Hollywood Brown, as Mike mentioned, uh, definitely sneaky and in a solid spot here, 6,500. The Steelers defense is beat up. Uh, Mark Andrews priced up to 6K as well. Do you like anybody on the Ravens side of things? Yeah, I feel like there's two things working against each other. Like, obviously, we've seen the Pittsburgh defense get completely diced up, even by Justin Fields, if we remember in that primetime game. But then at the same time, we've seen Lamar Jackson just be so shaky. I mean, if you remember, speaking of primetime games, Miami threw a zero blitz at him pretty much every single quarter, and they couldn't figure it out. Like, he just they just couldn't figure it out. And so it's one of those things where I, I, Pittsburgh at home, scheming for Lamar Jackson, I could see them finding some success. I could also see them getting beat. Uh, one or two times. And if that happens, all the target share, it's really going to Marquise Brown and Mark Andrews. So if you're going to stack this game, I mean, I mentioned Rashad Bateman as, as a value on Tuesday, but honestly, his target share has really been decreasing. It's really concentrated on Marquise Brown and Mark Andrews. So if you're going to stack that game, which I'm probably not going to, uh, certainly Lamar to Marquise or Lamar to Mark Andrews makes sense. I love the Chase Claypool call because it's one of those like slate breaking great tournament plays. And you're right, he hasn't scored a touchdown, but even though, like, the, just the last two games, he's had 17 targets. These are bad games for Ben Roethlisberger, and he's almost put up 100 yards in each of those games, even though his catch rate hasn't even been that that good. So imagine just grabbing a couple more of those targets just from a catch rate standpoint and actually getting in the end zone. I mean, this could be one of those weeks where you're like, oh, wow, I'm the only one with Chase Claypool, and that's why I won my tournament. So I love that play. Obviously, I like Deontay, too. He's going to get peppered with targets, and he's a... He's always going to be in a good cash game spot. Claypool currently projecting for right around 3% ownership. So again, it's just like one of those players in a tournament that uh, can, can really set you apart from, from everybody else. Let's get to the Don. Last week, the picks were okay. Jacob, you don't know the Don, but uh, I would like to formally introduce you to my dad. He, you know, he's got like this midlife thing going on. He He's the Don. He's, uh, he's the godfather of me and my friend group. Uh, it's it's a long story. <laughs> but anyway, he plays a lot of DFS. He plays a lot of fantasy in general. Uh, and these are his sneaky picks here in week 13. Awesome. Hi, everybody. This is the Don. Last week, the sneaky picks was so-so. So this week, we're going to go with first sneaky pick will be Josh Reynolds. And Love your it. bonus pick is going to be Jawan Jennings. And you can take that to the bank. Take it to the bank. Uh, both players currently projecting for 5% ownership or less. We spoke about Josh Reynolds, uh, Juwan Jennings, you know, a little bit more out there. But, hey, they're supposed to be sneaky for a reason. So that <laughs> you need someone to save some money on this week. Some wide receivers, Josh Reynolds and Juwan Jennings. Let's wrap up with our Week 13 cheat sheet, our favorite value, Chalk, Contrarian Plays, and our favorite stack. Uh, Sia, we will start with you. 
So I kind of cheated with the value play because normally I know we we kind of like to keep it under 5K and I'm going by DraftKings pricing here. But the, the ones I wanted to play, like the main one I wanted to play, uh, Frank already had that and I couldn't steal his. So I'm just going to go with Jamal Williams at 5,400. who's was, was close to that 5,000 threshold we like to be under. Uh, he's, a, he's obviously a chalky play as well, but I think Jamal Williams is obviously in a good spot, both from a running and pass catching standpoint. Chalk play, we've talked about him a lot. No need to talk about him anymore. I'll just say his name, Antonio Gibson, in a great spot, probably three down roll. I, I hope he's healthy the entire game. Contrarian play, I talked about him at the top of the show. Russell Gage, I love the Tom Brady stack with any of the receivers, including Gronk. And I like bringing it back with Patterson, yeah, but I, I really prefer to save the money and take the chance on Russell Gage if I'm going to correlate that stack. Uh, and the stack, by the way, spoiler alert, I, I kind of just spoiled it, right? Brady to Gronk is my stack. I could have gone Brady to Godwin or Brady to Evans, Evans, but I think Gronk is going to be the more reliable pass catcher from a target standpoint. So Brady to Gronk, if I had to throw in another receiver, it would likely be Godwin. All right, Jacob, you are up. Favorite value, chalk, contrarian, and stack here in week 13. I just wanted to first pay my respects to the Don coming with John Jennings and Josh Reynolds take some real kahunas. I really love that. Those calls. That's that's world. Um, my value play is Sterling Shepard. We've already mentioned him 4,900 um, more of a tournament play than anything else. Uh, chalk play is Moreau could be the value play as well, but I, I'm just loading up in cash and we'll have quite a bit in tournaments as well. Uh, contrarian play. We've talked about at length already as well. That's Chase Claypool. I um, think you should get him at sub 5% ownership. And then my stack, um, we've mentioned a little bit as well. It's Kirk Cousins to Justin Jefferson and bringing it back with Jamal Williams, uh, hoping that something weird happens in the NFL. You know, you never know what's going to happen in these games and possibly Detroit does get up early and is able to control the ball, you know, on the ground, like we talked about, because of the matchup there against Minnesota, who has not been good against the run. And if that happens, then we should see Minnesota have to be more pass heavy. Um, and they're going up against a Detroit secondary that uses press coverage at one of the highest rates in the NFL. And press covering Justin Jefferson is just an unbelievably bad idea. <laughs> um, he has averaged 3.3 yards per route run for his press coverage, uh, in his career. Um, and since the time he's been in the NFL, the average is 1.5. So he's more than double the average, the league average rate. And he's also 15% higher than the next highest player. He's just unbelievable. You don't want to press cover him. You can't, it's just not going to work. Um, so if Minnesota has to pass in this spot, I think we're going to see Jefferson go off similar to what we saw in week four or five when they played last time. Yeah, definitely going to have some Justin Jefferson this week. Mm -hmm. Definitely uh, with you there. Value play for me, I'm stealing it from the Don, man. Josh Reynolds, 3,400. I, I like quite a bit. You need a salary saver at wide receiver. Uh, Jacob mentioned all the air yards that he's getting the past couple of weeks, has that rapport uh, with Jared Goff. So I do like that. The chalk play, Alexander Madison, I still don't mind it. 7,600. He made two starts earlier this season, filling in for Dalvin Cook. One of those games came against the Detroit Lions. He went off. He had over 30 DK points in that game. Obviously, a really strong matchup here for him. Contrarian, we mentioned the name earlier. Van Jefferson. I think Cooper Cup, obviously going to garner some ownership. I think Odell Beckham, uh, for obvious reasons, you know, his name, uh, just the fact that, you know, who he, who he is uh, going to garner some ownership there as well. Van Jefferson, uh, I do like quite a bit at 5,300 in that game. And my stack is Derek Carr to Hunter Renfro. Um, I like that game quite a bit. The third highest total on the slate. Bring it back with Antonio Gibson. I think that might be pretty popular. Uh, maybe, you know, in a tournament, you, you fade Gibson there and you play Logan Thomas, something like that. Uh, I have no problem with it. Uh, so I do like Derek Carr to Hunter Renfro quite a bit. You could obviously do Derek Carr to uh, to Foster Moreau if you want to do that as well. Uh, I want to thank you, Jacob, for uh, joining us here. Again, you can listen to him. Fantasy Football Today, FFT and 5. Read his work over on Sportsline. Make sure you follow him on Twitter. Amazing work there. J.A. Gibbs underscore 23. We uh, appreciate you joining us here today. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me on. I wanted to mention on Hunter Renfro, dude, like I had not thought about him at all. And he definitely stands to see an increase in targets and Washington blitzes a ton. And this is just a random fact, but Hunter Renfro is fifth in the NFL in target per hour run rate win blitz. It's like really, really high. And Darren Waller is like eighth. And so if Waller's out of the equation, like he could just get peppered with targets. And I think he's somebody who people are not going to think about very much. So I think that's a really sharp call. Just wanted to mention that. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. And, he, and he's cheap too. Like he's he's fifty eight hundred, yeah. and he's got like a legitimate role in the offense. Um, you know, we don't usually see you know guys like Hunter Renfro like alpha wide receivers, but it's kind of what he's doing right now. Uh, yeah. We're gonna wrap there for C and Jacob. I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching fantasy football today. At DFS will be back again on Tuesday to recap all of Week Thirteen, take an early look at Week Fourteen pricing. We will see you then.